You know, we're on the book of Ephesians and we're actually, we're going to be on this, this passage for, for quite a while. Have you noticed that the book of Ephesians, there's so many contrasts, you know, there's contrast in it. That's what we've been, been talking about. There's darkness and there's light. There's believers as we were before we believed and then as we now are. And it talks about putting off the old self and putting on the new self. It talks with it talks about stopping the unwholesome talk and use our speech to build up one another. And this passage that we are looking at today is no exception. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Not foolish, but know what God wants. It's all in there. And, and, and I think that maybe one of the distinctions that Paul, that God is trying to make through the apostle Paul that's inherent in following Christ is that there's a difference in the life of a believer when compared to the, to the non-God world. And now we come to a verse that in many ways is the pinnacle of all contrast. Do not be drunk with wine, instead be filled with the Spirit. What happens when a person is drunk? They're controlled by whatever they're drinking. I mean, you might have heard, heard someone describe this before. They really change once they start drinking. And a person who is drunk may think that they're acting right or they think that they're thinking right, but their decisions are impacted because they're under an influence that's outside of them that isn't good. And so when you look at this verse, verse 18, I think in other words, after all that has been said about the contrast between the godless ways of the world and walking with Christ, He's saying, do not let yourself be influenced by the wine of the world, by the wine of that old way of life. Do not be drunk with wine. Do not be controlled by it. Influence. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled and empowered by the Spirit of God. This, in my opinion, which I value way too much, This is the one of the most significant verses in all the New Testament when it comes to how to live as a Christian. And so we need to ponder it for for several weeks. It's hard to get our minds around it. The Holy Spirit, what does it make you think of? You know, you know, the the oh, I have no troubles explaining God. It's the Trinity. I mean, everybody can understand the Trinity, three in one, you know. So we think about God, we think God the Father, and I can think about that. I mean, there's something there. I can get a handle because, you know. I have a father and I'm a father and you kind of understand that. So you get, and you get an idea of what God is like. You know, there's certain things, you know, it's beyond our imagination, but you can kind of, that word father, we can kind of understand. And then Jesus, you know, he walked, he talked, he ate, he slept. He did a lot of things that we do because, because he was human. He was fully God and fully man. And we learn about it. In Sunday school, we learn about his time with the disciples and his, his teaching, his miracles, his walking on water. And, 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 and we, we even have that picture we grew up with on most of Sunday school walls of, of, of uh, you know, Jesus looking up into a soft light with perfect hair. You know, looks kind of like, kind of like the, the best of us. So I can kind of get a, an understanding of Jesus. But the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. At least I say I do every time I recite the Apostles' Creed. But, but I've got to say, you know, people will say, well, I'm not really sure who the Holy Spirit is. And to be filled with the Spirit, what does that really mean? Well, here's the big idea of where we're headed. I have to ask you, you know, is, is the Christian life easy? Now, some people might say it is easy. But I think for most people, if you're really serious about living in a way that follows the Lord and we're honest... It's not always easy to be a Christian. Sometimes it's very hard to be a Christian. Sometimes the way we want to go and think and act goes counter with what we know God would have us do. I mean, think about it. Obey everything that Jesus tells us to do. How many of us do that all the time? You know, how about obeying the Ten Commandments? How about obeying just eight of them or six of them? How about just obeying the number one commandment? I'll have no other gods before me. I've got a worn out Bible at home and actually several pages are missing. And sometimes I think, well, I couldn't do what's on those pages anyway. It's just too much. (laughs) You know, we can think that way. The reality is that living the Christian life is difficult when we try to live it on our own. Sometimes we have to have faith when we don't feel like having faith. 
Sometimes we get mad at God. If we're honest. Life is a, being a, trying to be a perfect Christian is not hard. It is actually impossible. It is impossible for us to fully live a Christian life on our own. And it's impossible to obey every command in the Bible on our own. But you see, God never intended for us to live the Christian life on our own. He didn't go through all the effort of having Jesus die for us and then bring us to the point where we respond to the gospel and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. All of that just so he could say, okay, best of luck. Now go out there and do it. Go out there and live the Christian life and make me happy. You know. See, toward the end of Jesus' life, when he was in the, uh, on this side of the cross, when he was in the upper room with the disciples in John chapter oh, 12 to 17, it's all a conversation that he was having with his disciples, important things that he wanted to tell his disciples. So he's up there in the upper room having this conversation and he made a bold and bewildering promise. He told his disciples that he was going away, that he was moving, and that his going away was actually a very good thing for everybody, for the disciples and for everybody else. And why was it good that he had to go away? Why would he say that? Because even though he was going away, which referred to his death on the cross and his ascension into heaven, he says he was sending another like me, the Holy Spirit, a comforter to come aside, aside the disciples and we're his disciples, to come alongside of you, to live in you, to guide you, to enable us to live in a manner that God calls every Christian to live. <clears throat> I mean, think about this. Think about what, what he's telling us. <clears throat> I mean, whatever or whoever the Holy Spirit is, he's saying that it's better that the Holy Spirit is with us moment by moment than if Jesus was still with us moment by moment. That's an interesting thing. So we need to get our arms around that. That's right. For the next several weeks, we're going we're gonna to look at some questions. Today, we're going to look at who is the Holy Spirit and then we're going to look at why God gave us the Holy Spirit. And then what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And then how to do that. Today, what is, who is the Holy Spirit? And some people, you think of the word Holy Spirit, we think of it some type of power. Like, may the force be with you. The Holy Spirit is God's force. Or we think of the Holy Spirit, or we think of the Holy Ghost. I mean, we, we, we think of a ghost. And we think, maybe we think of Casper the Ghost. Or somebody that's mysterious or ethereal or, or you know, we think of it like, like a wind or, or a vapor. And it actually makes sense why people might think this way. Because the word for spirit is pneuma and that means wind or that means breath. And the spirit of God is like the wind. We might not see the wind, but we know the effects. We can see the effects when the wind blows. And the Holy Spirit has been called the breath of God. Breath is a sign of life. And it just so happens when a person is born again, it means they're literally given new life. Jesus calls it being born of the Spirit. So we think about those words that Jesus says. He says, I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. And unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And that's what happened. How would you feel if you're a disciple? You're there in that room. You're confused already about, about some stuff that's happening. You know, and, and you hear him say that. I'm going away. But Jesus, we, we want you to be with us. We like it. We like how it is. Come on. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not some sort of compensation for Jesus leaving them. You know, well, sorry you have to go, Jesus. Uh, you know, I mean... You're our number one draft pick, but, but if we can't have you, I guess we'll settle for the second pick in the draft. The Holy Spirit, it's not that way at all. The counselor literally means one who comes alongside you, one who is of the exact same, one who is absolutely identical, not like two brothers. Well, he's just like his brother. Closer than that, 
Not like a twin, closer than that. Not like a reflection in the mirror, even closer than that. Identical, the same thing. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Another thing is, what is it? What is it? What is the Holy Spirit? It's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has personality. God the Father has personality. Jesus has personality. Three in one, the Holy Spirit is a person. Not so much, and we think of a person, we say, I can look and I can see you. We, we think of a person as flesh and blood, but he has personal characteristics. The Holy Spirit can think. He can speak like a person. He can engage in relationships. He has a purpose like a person. He exists. Let me just tell you some of the ways that the Holy Spirit exists with his purpose. Genesis 1, he is present in creation. It says the Holy Spirit was brooding across the waters when the earth was formed. When God created man, you know what he said? He said, let us make man in our image. The Holy Spirit was active in creating the world and in creating man. Another thing the Holy Spirit does <clears throat> He communicates. How so? The Holy Spirit is involved in writing the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. You've heard that verse before. The word breathe is the same for the word spirit. And then if you were to read 2 Peter, it tells us that the authors of the Bible that God picked to pen these words, it says were moved by the Spirit of God. In other words, God didn't just say, okay, here's some big ideas. Now, go ahead and write what you, what you think, but just keep these big ideas in mind. It wasn't like that. The Spirit of God literally moved in the hearts of these men using their personalities to shape what, was being, what God wants to say and said to the world. He communicates. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about this from a human perspective. The Bible was written by what? About 40 Men from all walks of life, over 1,500 years. I mean, think about it. Moses, Moses is a shepherd. Isaiah, big, big book in the Bible. He was a prophet. Ezra, priest, was David, wrote a lot of the Psalms. He was a, he was a shepherd. He was a king. He was a sinner. John was a fisherman. Matthew was a tax collector. Luke was a physician. Paul was a tent maker. All of these authors over 15 centuries. And somehow the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Somehow the Bible doesn't contain any errors. All authors that are there present diff different perspectives, but what do they do? They all proclaim the one true God and they all point over 1,500 years, this document was put together by the Holy Spirit, all pointing to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, communicates the words of God. And he does something else. He gives life to the words that are in the Bible. That's really, you know, the Bible is the best-selling book in the world. But the reason that it's unique, it's a book that has life through the Holy Spirit. It's a completely unique book. <clears throat> Different from every book that has ever been written. Every command that's in the Bible, he helps us do. Every promise that God makes in the Bible, the Holy Spirit applies it to us. <clears throat> Every assurance that we can have as members of the family of God, he makes it happen in our hearts. Ephesians 6 calls the word of God the sword of the spirit. It says, take hold of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Somehow, being filled with the spirit, whatever that means, is connected with the word of God. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the spirit. Now listen to what Colossians 3 says. Let your heart be filled with the word of Christ. That's the vehicle, that's the means that God has given us so that we could draw closer and closer to him. There's a connection. Because you see, every Christian that looks to the word of God by faith and seeks to have it be a part of their lives can experience the presence and power of the Spirit of God. Did you get that? When we look at the Word 
and we try to see it for what it really is, and we apply faith to it, I believe this is the word of God, and it's a letter written to me, and I want it to make a difference in my life. When we apply that by faith, we can sense the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. He's the active author of Scripture. It's fascinating. And he's also the activator, and he's also the applier of the Word of God. That's why the Bible is a different book. So it's unlike any other book written. Hebrews 4, there's written years and miles from Ephesus or Colossae, the passage I just quoted, says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to penetrate deeply into the heart. Why is that true? Because the Holy Spirit breathes life into the word of God. He communicates authoritative, supernatural communication. Not only is the Holy Spirit responsible for the activity of the word of God in our lives, he is involved, if you really think about it, in all of the actions of God throughout history. We already talked about creation. We already talked about um, making man in his image. He was present there. He was also present where? He was present at Jesus' conception, wasn't he? He was present at Jesus' baptism when Jesus was commissioned for his ministry. He's present prior, during, and after a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says you must be born of the Spirit. He is called, we've talked about how God has taken every believer and adopted him into his family. That's what we talked about in the first couple of chapters of Ephesians. We are adopted into the family of God, having the full rights and inheritance that Jesus Christ has. We have that. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of adoption. He is the active agent in the Godhead. Present in Acts, you know the story, the, those, those unlearned fishermen were speaking with such power in the inauguration of the church and he's present in the church today. He resides in every believer. He resides in us. First Corinthians says our bodies are the temple of the Spirit of God. He shares the same attributes as Almighty God. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. He's all-powerful. He's infinite. He's eternal. He is God. And he is living and active in every believer as we cooperate with him. And he's living and active in the world. Every time God's actions are mentioned in the Bible, the Spirit is actively present. Why? Because he is God. So, we've attempted to answer that first question. If you don't remember anything else, the Holy Spirit is God. And he is present in our lives. And I think that, that if we as believers think actively and think deeply, uh, this wonderful truth that the Holy Spirit is the same God of infinite majesty and glory and holiness and power and that he has come to make his home inside of us and help us enjoy the fullness of God and enable us to be the instruments of his glory. That's a very, very, it's a very humbling thing. How can I experience the Holy Spirit of God? I'll leave you with this simple thought. How to experience the Holy Spirit of God? You ask the Lord, Lord, may you have more of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. It's better. And you've sent your Spirit to the church. Your Spirit is in the church. Sometimes we see it more. Sometimes we see him less. And yet, you have promised that he's always there. May we sense the presence of your Holy Spirit as we learn to appreciate him even more. All for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.